Hello, my name is Paul Jonak, and this video describes how I built a white blood cell classifier. This project was undertaken as the final project for the deep learning course at the Harvard Extension School. Our blood is comprised of red blood cells, white blood cells, platelets, and more. Doctors take blood samples to get approximate counts of these components to monitor your health or diagnose conditions. As an example, a bacterial infection will result in a high white blood cell count, and a low count may indicate a viral infection. Another way we could approach this is by identifying the class of white blood cells present. Each class has specialized roles as part of your immune system. Therefore, understanding which cell types are over or underrepresented could provide crucial diagnostic information. For the task at hand, we assume a blood sample has been taken and we now have images of the white blood cells within that sample. The goal is to identify which class of white blood cells is present for each image. Going a bit deeper into the background, we'd like to briefly cover the role played by each white blood cell and show a corresponding sample image from the data set. Starting at the top right, we have basal fills. These cells act as a warning system by releasing chemicals to increase blood flow to a target area, which in turn results in more white blood cells arriving. Next are eosinophils, which fight parasitic infections and allergic reactions. They also happen to look awesome. Lymphocytes are not nearly as photogenic, but they are incredibly important in that they fight viruses and cancer. Second from the bottom are monocytes, which collect dead, um, which collect dead cell debris and present these remains to lymphocytes. This information exchange allows lymphocytes to make antibodies to help fight future infections. Last are the neutrophils, which are the most abundant white blood cell. These cells are responsible for fighting bacterial and fungal infections. The data used for this project was found on Kaggle at the URL shown here. For the viewers not familiar with Kaggle, it is an online platform for data science competitions. These competitions involve prize money or the chance to interview at the company hosting the competition. Subsequently, it is a good place to find data sets to apply your machine learning skills. The data set used for this project consists of approximately 400 images covering five classes. Exploring the data revealed that one class, basophils, had very few images. We dropped basophils from analysis and then used augmentation on the remaining four classes to expand the data set. We opted to generate a data set with 3,000 images per class. Additionally, the images were downsampled by a factor of four and the pixel values were adjusted to be within the range of zero to one. For this project, the code was developed with Python 3. The modeling was done with Keras using a TensorFlow backend. More specifically, the GPU variant of TensorFlow was used alongside NVIDIA's deep neural network libraries. The other Python packages include CV2 and PIL for image handling, NumPy and Pandas for general data handling, and Matplotlib for visualization. I'm very lucky to have had a fairly powerful work computer to train these models on. In particular, the heavy lifting was done by two 1080 Ti's. Before building any models, the course material was scanned for problems of a similar nature. As dogs and cats are merely a collection of cells, the dog cat classifier built in week six seemed like an appropriate place to start. The model provided was built by Francois Collet. We adapted his model by changing important parameters into variables and then performing a grid search to see which values would provide the best model. This was first done on a small subset of the data followed by a narrower search on a medium-sized data set. Once the optimal model structure was determined, we looked at other properties, such as the optimizer, as well as options for dealing with overfitting. We'd like to direct the viewer's attention to the two plots showing accuracy across epochs when using L2 regularization on the left and dropout on the right. These charts were generated on the medium data set we see that dropout performs slightly better than L2 regularization, though neither appears to reach 90% validation accuracy. When we move from the medium data set to the full data set, three things happen. First, 
Dropout performs very poorly in comparison to L2 regularization, though this isn't shown here. Second, with L2 regularization, our validation accuracy passes 93% even before full convergence. Lastly, the validation loss plot on the right indicates that overfitting has been thoroughly addressed. We are quite, we are quite pleased with these results as a first pass. Now we're going to take a look at a short demo to see what the output from the model looks like. All right, so to begin, we have our packages. I'm just going to load those, and you can see that we are using the CPU, unlike the GPU, which was used during training. I'm just going to get some path information put in. And now we are ready to load our model. The summary output shows that we have an intermixing of four convolutional layers and three max pooling layers. This is then followed by a flattening layer and then two dense layers. You can see that the last dense layer has an output of four and that relates to the four classes of white blood cells that we're looking at. We're ready to now make our predictions. So the first thing that we're going to do is we are going to set up our image data generator. This is from the Keras package, specifically the pre-processing routines. We use the image data generator to augment the data set and also to prepare the images to be fed in to the model during training in batches. We really like this because it allows us to have a really large data set and not worry about running out of memory when we're training. But that also means that we should use the image data generator here when we're making our predictions. So we're going to go ahead and get that set up. And what it's done is it's gone ahead and grabbed all of the test images and it's already um, it's already sort of prepared them to be run. And now we are actually going to make our predictions on that. So one of the things that I've included here in this output is we've taken a look at the very first image and we said what is the output from the model. It was mentioned that we were supposed to get four, um, four, four values back with each position denoting a class of white blood cell. So we can see here that we have a really high value for the first position, which is eosinophils, and then we have very low values for the next. The very last one would be neutrophil. We have monocyte, sorry, monocyte here, and lymphocyte here. We want to visualize this, so we make a quick little function, and we can run it on five random samples. So what our little function did was it presented the image. We have the name, or the path, I should say, just to make sure that indeed the class is, um, is neutrophil. And then we have our prediction, which is neutrophil. Was it a match? Yep, so that's great. Let's move on to the next one. We have lymphocyte, lymphocyte, monocyte, monocyte, lymphocyte, lymphocyte, and ooh, neutrophil and eosinophil. And eosinophil, sorry. Um, so we see that for one of our predictions, it was actually wrong, um, which makes sense. We had 93%, not 100% accuracy. Let's see what happens when we run it again. So eosinophil, eosinophil, monocyte, 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 monocyte lymphocyte, lymphocyte, monocyte, monocyte. And there we go, those all worked. All right, let's get back to the presentation. So the lessons learned from this project center around time and planning. Model building and model tuning can be time consuming. Therefore, one should try to build off past work where possible. And you should also have a clear plan for your tuning 
with an understanding of which parameters you want to focus on first. It was found that overfitting should be dealt with last. This is evident by the drastic performance difference seen with L2 regularization and dropout when moving from the medium data set to the full data set. With a larger data set, L2 regularization performed perfectly while dropout was disappointing. With that said, perhaps changing the dropout rate would have led to even better results. But this sort of reasoning could lead to excessive tuning. Be mindful of your time and have a general idea of when the model is good enough. For this project, the final model met and exceeded our expectations. It could be better, but we're really happy with it as a first pass. I'd like to conclude by thanking our professor, Zoran Djordjevic. I'm really sorry if I butchered that, that name. Um, also, Francois Collet and all the other hardworking TAs. Thank you for a great course.